Okay, we're back from that break. Um, hoping all you're enjoying all the uh, political ads. You know, tomorrow is election day, and uh, so it's your chance to get out and vote. Um, and of course, I'll use my show as a stepping stone to again to vote uh, against Obamacare um, and a vote, a vote against the government um, intervention into our lifestyles and to uh, the health care that we receive. Um, there are plenty of seniors in this community who have worked long and hard. Um, there are plenty of disabled people um, who have earned the right to, you know, have government-assisted programs. Um, and then there are the people, the less unfortunates, that do uh, indeed uh, deserve to have uh, access to health care. And then, unfortunately, there are people who are just downright lazy um, and um, don't really want to work for what they have, or, and and those are being entitled to health care. And I, I have a personal issue with that. Um, while everybody else is working hard and trying to survive, people are being handed stuff for um, essentially no effort at all, and I think that rewards no one. So that's my conservative um, and political view on on that and Obamacare. Um, I think it was. Uh, I think we need to do something to fix the health care system. Um, I know it's broke. Everybody knows it's broke. Um, it's sad when we pay huge amounts of money uh, for medicines and, and pharmaceuticals. Um, when you can go into Mexico and get them for next to nothing, or Canada and get them a lot cheaper. I mean, what? What is that? I mean, why, why are we being punished uh, for a good health care system? And in fact, going to the doctor is a very small fraction of your total health care cost. Um, you know, going going to the pharmacy is the is a huge thing. And when they when they calculate health care costs, they do it even when you buy Advil or if you buy cough syrup or any over the counter product for health, it, it goes into that number that they talk about how much we spend on our health care. Um, so while I know doctors, they, they, they'll charge a lot for their visits, insurance companies will only pay so much. And if the system was so that people, um, the idea that we pay to, into an insurance company and they're going to pay our claims is, 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 is an oxymoron. I mean, insurance companies are in the business to make money, and I've said this over and over and over again. They're in the business to collect premiums, not to pay claims, even though they do. Um, that's 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 not their their business um and so coding and getting the right codes and getting the billing in on time and getting all of these other things um it's it, it's a quagmire i wish it was just the old cash pay system you go in you know the cost would come down dramatically um but everybody's worried about catastrophic health care and and these things of nature and the policies they put out for obamacare were horrific um, and that's where you need to have your vote. You need to align along conservative lines so that hopefully we can get rid of, of this. And, and I don't think, I mean, Obamacare is a law of the land. It can be fixed so that it fits better for our population. Anyway, back to tonight's subject, uh, diabetes. Um, Again, I want to bring out the slide to reiterate the uh, hemoglobin A1C issue um, and, and go over those again quickly. Um, remember, five or six or less is, is a non-diabetic range, um, and then those numbers creep up all the way to 6.5. And remember, when you're younger, you want to have a lower number, lower as possible non-diabetic range to prevent the late complications of diabetes. And when you're older, those numbers need to go higher to help prevent um, uh, the late the the complications of low blood sugar that that insulin coma that everybody talks about not when your sugar is high that's diabetic ketoacidosis but insulin coma is when you take insulin and you cannot control your blood sugar insulin is one of the treatments we'll talk about but when you give insulin by injection you can't get it back and it will lower your blood sugar whether you want it to or not and those are the time that's a dangerous drug it's a it, you know um, people need to learn how to use that right one of the other testing that that we're going to talk about is this uh, test called glycomark you probably never really heard much about it um, as the average blood sugar hemoglobin a1c is a six-week phenomenon the glycomark is a very short-term phenomenon it's basically a sugar that is first is one of the first sugars uh, that you create after you eat um, 
and it has an inverse relationship. Um, imagine that I've got a, uh, a beaker, um, and what we'll do with that is that the beaker will be high, and it'll be a column, and in the, the sugar that we eat will be fed into the bottom, and it will float to the top. This is a creme sugar, a creme de la creme of the sugars. And as your blood sugar rises up, it pushes that this glycomark to the top, and then once you get above a certain level, it spills into your kidneys. So that brings us back to the point where if it's an inverse relationship, meaning the higher your glycomark is, the lower your blood sugar is after you eat. And the reason, again, is because when you lower your blood sugar after you eat, it's not being spilled into your urine. So if you have a low glycomark, okay, a low number, then your sugars are very high after you eat. Now, why is that important? Because I use that with the hemoglobin A1C. Give me give you a case in point. If someone comes in and their hemoglobin A1C is 5.6, they're right on the borderline, and we happen to do a glycomark and that is low, that tells me that person is very insulin resistant, meaning their sugars are going very high after they eat, but they're making a ton of insulin and bringing their sugars down when they're not eating. So it helps to tell you how a person is doing with mealtime, uh, how a person is struggling um, with their diabetes, because you can have an average blood sugar of 5.6 and you can look good, but you can really be pre-diabetic with a normal hemoglobin A1C, depending on what your uh, uh, glycomark is. So very useful test, very short-term test. I have seen patients who have an elevated glycomark, uh, an elevated HbA1c, and their glycomark is normal a couple of days because they know they're going to get their blood drawn, so they eat really well. It's the same thing people used to do with their cholesterol. Um, we would basically have uh, them diet very well uh, before they got their cholesterol, and so their cholesterol number would come down. But that actually hurts your overall ratio because the uh, rapid phase reactant, the HDL, drops out much quicker than your total cholesterol. So you're better off to do things consistently and moderately. Um, so. Glycomark is another test that I use in the office uh, for determination of how well you do with meal time. It also tells me how well the our treatments are working. It tells us how well um, the insulin is working if you're taking insulin. So it's a very useful number. Um, the other number of tests we'll use is a fasting insulin test. Now this is a test um, where you actually will draw your fasting insulin. Well, what is it? Well, insulin obviously is what you make. Um, as we get older, um, normal values are two to four. And what that means is when we check your value, it should be somewhere on two to four. Now I would see that with an 80 blood sugar, um, an 85 blood sugar, I gotta expect to see a low um, insulin. What if I have a blood sugar that is uh, 80 and I check their insulin and it's 10? Well, that tells me that this person um, is basically putting out a lot of insulin, that they were very good when they drew their blood test, but that high insulin level tells me that they are pre-diabetic, that they basically are having to pump out a lot of insulin to control that blood sugar. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you have an engine in a car and you're running and if you have to stop at a light and your car is going ka-chunk, ka-chunk, but you have to keep your foot on the gas to keep the idle up and you have to idle at 3,000 RPM to keep your car running, well, guess what? You're going to have you're gonna burn out that motor. And that's the same thing with adult onset diabetes, meaning that if you have to make a lot of insulin to keep your sugar lower, then you're gonna burn out your pancreas, and that's gonna to lead to adult onset diabetes, meaning that's gonna to lead to that gradual increasing blood sugar. You're going to see your hemoglobin A1C go to 5.6 and then 5.7, and your fasting insulin levels will continue to rise, and your glycomark will be depending on what you eat. So we use all these three tests to try and, and put you into a category of where you're at with regards to this this long onset developing disease. And it starts when you're younger, it starts when you become sedentary, it starts when you start eating fast food, and you basically, when you're young and full of muscle, and you have a low, uh, I mean a nice BMI, you're burning it as fast as you can, but as you get older, 
Um, your muscle mass decreases, your fat stores increase, and basically you start developing insulin resistance. Um, you start to develop weight gain, and then your body tries to compensate for that weight gain by making more insulin, which is trying to bring your sugar down, which burns out your pancreas, and sooner or later you can't recover, and you become a diabetic. And so all these testings are used to, to help to quantify where you are in, in that particular model. It also is, allows us as physicians to kind of prognosticate how well you're going to do with the treatments that we're going to give you. Um, so let's talk, about, um, and again, I, I want to reiterate, this is the slide that's coming up, um, which basically um, I just got talking to which was to develop a onset diabetes. First we gain weight and we do all these other things. So, um, and then the next slide will be the, um, um, Basically, after we come back, we're going to talk a little bit about what diabetes does to us. I know I've talked about this in the other portions of the shows, um, but just to give you a heads up, we're going to talk about our heart and our blood vessels and our kidneys and how it affects our eyes and our nervous system and how it affects our immune system. So, um, And then if we have enough time tonight, um, when we get back from the last segment, um, we'll talk about treatment and a little bit about that, um, and we'll, we'll go into that. Um, so with that, um, let's just talk a little bit about why we want to prevent diabetes. Obviously, we want to prevent ourselves from developing this dreaded disease. It, it, it is probably at the core of all medicine. Um, in fact, um, one of the things I heard my father tell me, who, who um, unfortunately, may he rest in peace, recently passed away, and he would say, to know ye diabetes is to know ye all medicine. And I, and I do believe that is true, that, that diabetes is one of these diseases that affects every part of our body. Um, there's not one part of our body that doesn't get affected by diabetes. Um, and it is at the core of heart disease, of vascular disease, retinopathy, uh, blindness. It's just dialysis. That's you know that with blood pressure. It is this horrific disease. And uh, one of the impetuses in medicine and and what Medicare is doing is trying to get doctors involved in uh, better treatment um, um, and controlling everybody's sugar and putting you on the medications, making sure you're taking them. Um, and, and hopefully to reduce some of these things. We live in a society, again, where there's an overabundance of food and our genetic makeup has not caught up with the overabundance of food and the lack of activity. So we're gonna to go to break and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the things that are on the slide and we'll be right back. Thank you for tuning in tonight.